become uh, more problematic. And actually it should be the opposite. It should make it the most efficient form we can get because it'll be laid out perfectly. And this space, um, what will hopefully, I mean, ho hopefully this will fix the problem. I, I'm not, um, I don't think enforcement wise, we have the manpower yet to make sure this happens 100%, but it's something as we work with the city to get the lines painted, um, I think it'll be a positive thing for the residents of the city. So are there any questions about 403, yeah. Marsha? Yeah, and I understand from uh, the practical nature why you wanna do this, but the reality of the situation is it's almost like a domino effect. So let's say we have someone that violates the lines, okay? Then when you try to find the space, you're gonna to have to be in violation just to get a space in there. So unless everyone is obedient from the get-go, there's it's the person that doesn't mean to violate, and I've had this happen consistently in my neighborhood, okay? Uh, the people that don't mean to violate, just to be able to get a parking space are gonna end up having that happen. And I just don't know how we get around that, but the other part is the size of the vehicles and the amount of room that it takes to back up, depending on the size of the city street. At some times, that uh, with the space is fine, but in other situations where you're in areas where it's very hard to na navigate and parallel park, you're gonna run into problems. So I'm just trying to be really practical about, it doesn't, it's not like a, like a one size that fits all all throughout the city. Right. And I challenge anyone who loves to parallel park to come up in my neighborhood on the hills and try to do that when you have a limited amount of space that you can back into, uh, if that's the only space that's available. Yeah, absolutely. This this isn't going to be a silver bullet that's going to fix everything. Yeah. Um, I'm just so. thinking that it might be better to start at least in the areas where there's more room to do the lining than areas where there's sure. highly uh, congested neighborhoods. Okay. And try to work, you know, and rather than trying to do it citywide, you just might want to, you know, give that some thought. And also to let the neighbors, uh, people need uh, practice in how to parallel park. That's the other issue. <laughs> I can't help with that one. <laughs> I know. Yeah, the, um, additional questions. I, I know you got a short amount of time, but we, we may have to revisit this next Monday night. Go ahead, Johanny, and then Donna. So there are currently designated areas that have these lines painted on, or are we saying that we're going to be painting lines everywhere and we're going to begin enforcing and fines will be issued? So currently, the only line painting legally is in metered spaces by ordinance. Um, we are required to keep line spaces for meters. A any other place that it is in the city isn't really sanctioned that I've been able to find by ordinance. So yeah, th this would be citywide. And we would certainly welcome any suggestions from counselors, especially from where they are in their districts, where the most congested areas are. Um, as to where to start outside of, you know, the uh, paving project that the mayor announced, because the paving project, it, it'll be included in the RFP for that. Um, when we start the line painting outside of that project, we would welcome any suggestions from council on, on areas that are, you know, the most affected. We can also look at our heat mapping. Um, of violations and where we see the most violations based on the heat map and kind of focus on those areas. All right, additional questions, Donna. Uh, what's your experience in other cities? I mean, it strikes me when I go to visit other places, there are there are clearly delineated parking stall lines um, along with obviously meter line, meters and things like that. What's the experience in other cities um, both from the pragmatic standpoint and also cities that have um, the kind of topography we have with flatlands and hillsides and things like that. Do you know that offhand? So I've talked to a couple um, other directors and they said, especially you know, in your downtown areas, um, it was very helpful and in densely populated residential areas. Yeah. So you know, I, as mentioned before, I don't think we'll be prioritizing going into the less densely populated area where we have, you know, far less parking problems. 
Yeah, Nathan, I'm just going to jump in here. I, you know, my experience is in the in the densely parking in the densely populated areas that the parking is fairly compacted in now. I don't see, you know, you know, I, like I visit my friend often on Cotton Street, and you know, the people are parked pretty tight together. Um, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, my biggest fear is having a bunch of lines that take parking spaces away, especially in some of those neighborhoods where we're actually creating a little more space than what we might need. Um, I know there's there's probably a right time and place and space for this, I hate to use that word, but um, I just don't know, you know, not knowing the name, I, I wouldn't be for a, a across the board all over the city here, let's do this thing. I just think, um, you know, to Marcia's point, we might be creating more problems than we solve. I, I find that the people in the densely packed neighborhoods um, are parking as efficiently as they can. And as you very well know, they're, they're, they're sticking out in the corners. They're parking anywhere that they can because people need to park. Um, I don't think adding lines is going to add any parking in those neighborhoods. Uh, and it may just add more frustration. Um, so I'm really trying to understand the objective of the lines. You know, if it were somewhere like, uh, you know, even in my neighborhood, you know, we park pretty efficiently. I mean, we're not, it's amazing. We become really good parallel parkers in the city of Reading because we have sure. to. And what might not look like a space to somebody, we make a space out of it. And I, literally a park in spaces where there's eight inches in front of me and seven behind well, me. Well, that's what causes someone to, someone's car to get hit because it's so tight. Well, some cars get hit, but I never hit cars, Melissa. Not you, I think Melissa's point is well taken. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but but there's not room in, in a lot of these streets to put lines because it's going to take away parking. Is my point, and and maybe I'm wrong, but the 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 visualization that I see in my experience is that if we put lines, how wide are the lines apart? You know, there's a lot of small cars in the city. There's a lot of big cars in the city. Um, you know, what's the state? what about having them like on Main Street? Like for example, me, I live on 13th Street. Uh, uh, two ways, but you wouldn't want to put uh, white spaces on birch because it's so tight or as is. So something like that, maybe. Just an example. Yeah, and Jeff, you know, as, as I mentioned, this is something we can certainly, you know, once the framework's in place, we can certainly go, you know, district by district and, and look at it. Um, and not just, you know, go citywide right away. The ordinance is basically just giving us the ability to do it. Um, it doesn't mean we have to do it in every single neighborhood on every single block. Yeah, I would prefer, Nathan, and I'm not trying to be difficult, I would prefer you came back with a kind of a subset sample of blocks you, you think it would work on and allow us to kind of view it from that standpoint because Man, I, I hate to see us give carte blanche and then start hearing from some of these neighborhoods, what are you doing? Um, you know, parking is such a critical issue. We're, we're so overpacked with the density in the city. And I get that everything, I mean, I just feel like the things we do, we need to be doing to improve parking, but not take away parking. For those who can't park in eight feet, that's unfortunate, I mean, whatever the measurement is, but um, you know, we have limitations. Uh, just real quickly, Nathan, what is the average length of those spaces? They can be anywhere from 18 to 24 feet in length. Really? Yeah, it depends on what, 18 you know, what, what you're using. Feet. I mean, what's the average length of a, a Honda or a, or a Toyota Corolla? I mean, they're... Yeah, not, not 18 feet. That's yeah, they're sure. like, what are they? I mean, I, see, uh, that's my concern. I'm if we start sure. building these little islands of parking, we're going to, we're going to have a lot of problems. I, I guess I would like a little more specifics, you know, what blocks, if we did just kind of a prototype mm -hmm. block or, or 10 blocks, how many spaces would it create? What is our kind of our, our test count now? What do we see parking in those neighborhoods now? Is it, is it 40 cars and now we're going to be putting in 32 spaces? I mean, I think we have to be very deliberate in our calculations so that we know how much we're really going to impact parking. Are we going to improve it or are we going to make it worse? And, you know, if I could just quick go back to this for a second, basically this allows us also, this ordinance will give us the ability 
right now on Penn Street, if somebody parks on an angle and crosses the line into the other space, we, we really, without the, this language of saying you have to be able to park in the space and not over the line, you know, we can't enforce it. Um, so th this is a broader language um, well, versus- to a metered space though, Nathan, right? I'm referring to any space in the city. I mean, to me, it might make sense in the meter spaces, but until we gave a carte blanche across the city, I think we need, we need more um, calculated specifics. Personal. Yeah. Go ahead, Lucy. Thanks. Um, so I think we're I think we're kind of taking it ten steps ahead of where we are. Uh, what I'm seeing with this uh, proposed ordinance is really the ability to enforce parking within the lines where lines exist. And from what Nathan said, the only place right now where it exists is places like Penn Street. Where you have the metered spaces, I think our uh, we don't have the law in place yet created to be implementing more uh, line to sp space parking. I don't think we're there yet. Um, at least that's how I'm understanding this. Is is that correct, Nathan? Is is what's being proposed yeah. only for existing line space, and where is that existing line parking right now? Yeah, the ordinance doesn't address where. At, at all, it, this isn't, you know, this is giving the ability to enforce line enforcement um, throughout the city. And right now, the only existing lines, like I said, are at the metered areas. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I hope so that answers your question. It does, because I think the discussion is talking about how, you know, should we put more line parking spaces? What, you know, dimensions should they be? Where should they be? But that's not what I'm seeing. Um, in this bill, you know, in this amendment. So I want to stick to what the amendment is proposing. I think there's definitely a lot of dialogue and case studies and the parking studies that we need to look at in the future to, to, to further this, um, whether lines can help or make our parking situation worse. But what I'm seeing right here is, is very simple, which is the few spaces that we have line parking, how can we help you better enforce them? Yeah, that, that, um, that's my interpretation. Yeah, that's not what the ordinance is saying, though. If the ordinance, if you want to restrict it to the existing line spaces, that's a no-brainer. I think you told us most of the metered ones. This is allowing the parking authority to put lines in in other places, and I, I don't, I'm not ready to open that door up until we have more, at least me personally, more specifics around what that would look like. If the ordinance wants to just afford you the authority to enforce to the existing line spaces, which are primarily metered spaces, I don't have any problem with that. Um, but uh, what I'm hearing from you, Nathan, is that this is a more broad-based city effort where you believe it would be applicable. Right? Yeah, so Jeff, if, if we look at the language, it doesn't specifically say metered. It says, you know, just any place where there's lines or stalls painted. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you're right. This, this ordinance doesn't address us putting in lines at all. Um, I, I guess I should have presented them kind of differently. This is just dealing with the ability to enforce somebody parked over a line currently, um, wherever they exist. Only existing lines. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we, I, I, we can't. I have no problem with that. I think we'd have to build that into the ordinance if there's a consideration of the parking authority to add new lines, because I heard you referencing other neighborhoods and that's where my concern was. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 minutes ago, you said there's certain neighborhoods where you would, you would do it. If that's the case, then I'm not ready for that. And, and just, you know, for me to clear this up a little bit, we can't paint lines on the street without the city's approval. We have no authority to do that. Um, other than what is given to us in ordinance, which specifically talks about the lines at a metered space. Right. So we, we, we absolutely can't do that on our own. Um, All right, so without... we can bring this ordinance up to just say existing lines. If you want to come back and add lines at another time, then we can do that. But I heard you talking about neighborhoods and I, I, I reacted to that. So I apologize. We'll go to Marsha and then Johanna. Yeah, and to follow up on that point, the word existing is a time and place. So when we pass this ordinance, we would not... The word existing is too broad and I would like legal to weigh in on this because let's just say that existing one month may be different than existing the next month. So that in indeed, if uh, when the city's doing work on the streets and more lines are painted, then those become existing. 
So we really need to be able to draw the line in the sand, so to speak, and say, well, as of what date does this apply? And my belief is we need to have a, the parking study done to make it more comprehensive and not get ahead of ourselves, okay? And uh, I would like to be able to just limit the scope of it at this point to existing as of whatever date we decide and then moving on, see how that's effective and look at uh, the other potential, but not to be able to just leave it open-ended as far as what existing means. Johanny? So currently as the ordinance stands, right? I mean, it says uh, you're not allowed to park in these uh, designated park in, in the center of lines designating a parking space, right? So it's just, we just haven't been enforcing it at all. Is that what the issue is? Or, or we're... We, we haven't had any ordinance that we could enforce it with. Right, right. Okay. And then the, the enforcement part is just a fine. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of lines, I've seen lines on the 900 block of Washington. Are those metered spaces? No. So they'll be enforced there as well? This there's, ordinance will enforce, I mean, if we change this ordinance, they'll be enforced, you said, wherever there's lines. Yeah, so we, we have found that people have painted lines mm -hmm. on the street mm -hmm. and they've done it themselves. Um, exactly. <laughs> so. So yeah, what kind I, of I, enforcement I, takes place then? We, we don't, we, we don't enforce anything with lines currently because we don't have that tool so, I mean, there's something we could put in here. We could put in, add language, you know, um, legally, something about, you know, legal lines or something like that, or approved lines only. Yeah, that would work, Nathan. I mean, if we could clean it up with Linda, that's fine. Um, whatever, you know, the body's comfortable with, it'd be fine. Any other comments or questions, Donna? Yeah, I just, and I understand everyone's concerns here. I guess my concern is, you know, we're all concerned about the cars that they're halfway into the intersection park or they're parked in yellow spaces and they're parked. We have so many parking concerns and we all know what the, what the genesis of it was with the subdivided houses and multiple, multiple families in one property, multiple cars for the family. So we know, we know the whole background. We know the reality, but what are we going to, Hopefully, as, as these neighborhood lots open, that's going to create some degree of, of, of acceptability and, and, and better situations for the parking. But, you know, we have parking situations, again, of the cars that jut into the intersections, of the cars that are parked where they shouldn't be. And you guys can't enforce everything. I know you're out there and you're trying. But if we don't start putting some teeth into things, it's not going to get any better. So what's the answer? Do we let it go the way it goes? Or do we, even if we have to go, you know, in specific neighborhoods to start where the most, where parking has seen the most problematic parking, where the RPA has seen the most problematic parking, it just strikes me, we've, if we're not gonna do anything, then we've got to let the parking wars amongst, amongst citizens continue because then we're not, then we're not being proactive. We're just, we're just sitting around waiting because I know, I understand that even on my little street, sometimes if somebody has a gathering, it happens, it's very rare, but there's even parking issues on a suburban street like mine, but it's not exacerbated, but you know, we gotta, we gotta do something to alleviate the situation. And I applaud you for the neighborhood lots. I think that's gonna be a great start, but we've also gotta do something in the meantime. And I think this is a start, I believe that. Well, and I think you know, somebody alluded to, you know, the traffic studies that are going to be in place. I think that will give some of the answers, you know, on the surface, taking away parking is probably without the disciplines, the other disciplines isn't going to improve parking. So I think we have to be careful. Um, we have to do this thing. And there may be a time, Nathan, where this does work in certain neighborhoods. I don't, I'm not trying to shoot it down. I, I, I kind of overreach, but uh, I, I just think we have to, we have to walk tightly because there's, Man, parking yeah. is bad in some of these neighborhoods. It, it is. I mean, people are putting themselves, I think in many cases, they know they're going to get a ticket, but they've given up on where to park. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, there's just certain neighborhoods are just so densely packed. And I think even when we add parking, 
we're still going to have issues. I live across from a park, and I'm since I've been back home, I can't park. Yep. And uh, but that's you know it's it's just the way it is. Um, so it's a sensitive issue. I, I I think everyone's concerns are important, including Donna's. You know, regarding about how do we mitigate this? It's going sure. to be a very tactical, slowly, well thought out approach. Um, with also trying to be understanding of all the people trying to park. You know, like, like, um, so Jeff, I, I have to run into my other meeting here, um, but it, I will I will come back with a, a cleaned up language. Um, we'll work with Fred and our lawyer mail and, and get back to you if you're right. okay with that. Yep. Thank okay. You. Sounds good. Thanks. Dave. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, the administration. I don't know, Abe, if you're going to be introducing the um, sustainability coordinator. That shouldn't take us too long if they want to give us an intro if they're here and a um, little bit of overview of, of uh, their, their thoughts. And it's Nicole, right? Yes, it is. Uh, Pre uh, Council President Wallman, thank you for this opportunity. I am pleased to present Nicole Judge, who was our new sustainability manager, whose uh, credentials are outstanding. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to review uh, her experience and her academic record and her work record. She brings a tremendous amount of experience and a wealth of knowledge as it relates to her subject matter. And she also has experience in the private sector as well, which is only going to benefit us as a municipality. So without further ado, I'll just turn it right over to Nicole. All right, thank you for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to meet everyone. I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting a few of you already. So great to see you again. Um, and just to give you a little bit more uh, background about where who I am and where I came from. Um, I worked for Carpenter Technology most recently for about a year and a half in their environmental department, helping with compliance, but also helping them to develop their ESG strategy and ISO 14001 implementation strategy. Um, prior to that, I was in Nashville for about 10 years uh, and had various environmental ro roles with Bridgestone Americas, the tire manufacturing company, um, focused on compliance in their retail division, as well as tracking environmental sustainability metrics uh, across that division, um, as well as managing their tires forward program, which was a, a great program they created to help community cleanups of rivers recycle um, and uh, pick up and recycle any tires that they found uh, during those cleanups for free. So a lot of uh, great things that they've, they've done there. But today, what I really want to focus on is just showing a brief slide of uh, where we're at um, and where we'd like to go as far as next steps. Um, but prior to sharing that slide, I just wanted to recap the resolutions that uh, council passed in 2019, which was committing the city of Reading to achieving 100% clean and renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% clean renewable energy for heat and transportation by 2040 with the ultimate goal of 100% clean renewable energy for all energy use sectors within the community by 2050. Um, and furthermore, committed to achieving zero waste by 2050. So these are very ambitious goals, but they are necessary goals. And uh, we believe if we um, choose our projects and our objectives um, with intent, uh, that we can accomplish these goals. Um, so without, let me share my screen here. All right, and hopefully everyone can see this. Please let me know if you can't. So this is just a summary of what our next steps are as far as uh, sustainability plan implementation. I know that my predecessor, as well as the EAC um, and other members at Public Works had put in a lot of work prior to my coming on board and they have built a good foundation to start with. So um, our first step is going to be 
um, reviewing and evaluating those objectives and targets that they established in their draft climate resiliency plan um, and sustainability master plan to make sure that they're still relevant and appropriate um, for our goals and to meet those milestones in 2050. Um, second, we are going to uh, identify all the relevant internal and external stakeholders for each of those targets and objectives and then to perform a materiality assessment based on feedback from those internal and external stakeholders for each of those objectives. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to establish a ESG committee, which we have actually already had one meeting, um, which consisted of Steve Herity, the new solid waste division manager, Carlos Torres, the new Queen City coordinator, Beth Ayers Fisher, the community outreach coordinator, um, Ronald Epps and Madeline Collins, um, as well as Stan Rugas. Um, we expect to expand that membership as we identify um, additional stakeholders. From that, uh, we are going to establish working subcommittees that are focused on, um, we deemed as the six kind of focus areas for our sustainability plan under climate resiliency and energy, uh, our zero waste future, water, mobility, public health community development and quality of life, and economic development. Um, and these will also help to support the mayor's four pillars. These subcommittees will work on projects and develop policies to integrate sustainability into their departmental operations um, and aligned obviously with our objectives in that focus area. Um, uh, for number five, I have populate master targets and objectives file. This is a file I've compiled, um, was hoping to share with you all today, but unfortunately, first time connecting from home and I was not able to access that drive. So maybe you can share in the future. Um, but ultimately we would like to uh, make sure that all of our associated outreach and education events support those focus areas. Um, as well as any associated policies, ordinances, um, and then identify grant funding opportunities for those. Um, and then for seven, we will update the master plan and the climate resiliency plan um, to be current with the intent to share that publicly, um, which goes into number eight, which is our develop, develop our internal and external communication plan with the mayor's office and Christian to make sure that we're keeping everyone apprised of our progress on these, these goals and objectives. So that is what I have. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or um, you can direct them to me or Stan at a later date, if you wish. Um, yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, yeah, we had you down for a brief introduction, but I'm, we'll, we'll open it up for any quick questions. Um, and uh, we'll certainly have opportunities down the road uh, to get any updates you guys want to share with us relevant to your progress. Um, but welcome to Reading and open it up for questions. Anyone? I can't see everybody, so you're going to have to just, uh, Marcia. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much and welcome on board, Nicole. And being on the Environmental Advisory uh, Council, this is very consistent with the work that we've done, but I appreciate the structure. And it's a real good foundation for us moving ahead. I think council will benefit from updating as we start meeting some of those uh, goals uh, on the, you know, the time, uh, the mil a milestone timeline. So I look forward to more presentations. Thank you, Marsha. All right, D additional comments, Lucy? Hi, Nicole, welcome officially. Uh, I know that we've had the opportunity to speak a, a couple of times um, and congratulations on obtaining this position. I, I know that you uh, are going to do well and I see that already um, in having a sustainability plan and uh, implementation plan presenting to us. I think what I like most about this is that you're not only focusing internally on how the city is going to work towards this plan, but also externally to our stakeholders and our communities at large. So I look forward to continue to work with you on these efforts. Thank you, Lucene, and appreciate all of your input so far. <laughs> appreciate it. All right, additional comments or questions, anybody? 
All right. Uh, we thank you again, Nicole. Good luck with everything. And uh, you got quite a team there to work with. So uh, uh, thank you. I, pre I appreciate it. And thank you to the mayor's office and everyone for welcoming on board. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move on. Then we have uh, some time scheduled with uh, I didn't know we'd have the gentleman from Stantec with us this evening. That's great. And um, we're just trying to keep uh, city council apprised as well, because there's going to be some decisions down the road. Um, not all of them are clear at this point, but, uh, but we want to make sure that this body, not only on a one-on-one -on -one basis, is having an opportunity to have input, but to make sure that uh, we're, we're on the same page with the administration as to what's going on. And uh, we welcome you, gentlemen. I don't know if, uh, Jamal, you're going to start off, and then we'll, we'll turn it over from there. Yes, uh, thank you, Council President. Good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, as Council President mentioned, uh, today we are actually uh, going to present you with an update of where we are uh, as, of, as of this point. You all recall that uh, we've retained the services of Stantec uh, and they started working with the second part of January. We're still holding steadfast for the six months that probably will slip to seven months, but I'll let uh, Paul and uh, Dave explain uh, the schedule. Uh, some of you have already interviewed with Stantec and we received some valuable information from, from our city councils as well as the stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we are look, we, we're continuing to work on this. Uh, I'm gonna give the, uh, the floor to Paul and Dave. Paul is the project manager for, the, for this project. And David actually is, uh, by the way, uh, where the picture is says Paul Vernon, actually the gentleman there is actually David. I don't know if I can change this uh, on, the, on the screen, but uh, we don't have two Paul Vernons. We have Paul and we have David. So, uh, Gentlemen, why don't I give you the floor and uh, we will be more than happy to take questions uh, uh, and, uh, and, and comments later on. Thank you. So I'll, I'll let David start, but everyone should know that I am an identical twin. So David Dixon is my better looking and wiser identical twin for the, for the sake of, of, this, of this meeting and presentation. So David, go ahead, by all means. That's it, it, actually his nice way of saying I'm much older. But it is a real <laughs> pleasure and honor to, to be able to meet all of you. I, we've met a number of you and really would love to meet all of you <laughs> sort of, uh, more directly on, on uh, so we call them deep dive calls, to really understand your perspective, see Reading through your eyes, which is hugely helpful to us. Uh, we're going to be updating you on our progress to date. Uh, and I think uh, it is, as one actually important way to do that is to sort of introduce who is on our team and why and tell you that the why has been reinforced by the conversations we've had. So I'm the principal in charge, uh, the old guy. Um, Paul is our project manager and has been really excited about this work, as am I. Uh, Jeff Souser is somebody who's done a lot of all of it with me, downtown planning, and is bringing a lot of perspective on what have other downtowns tried around similar issues? Uh, Amanda Morell is actually uh, probably the leading person in Stantec, and there are a lot of us, a lot of us, on uh, virtual engagement with folks, which in this day and age, at least at the moment, is still hugely relevant, um, and we're actually finding very workable. Uh, Ralph Denisco helps lead our urban mobility practice, and when I say urban mobility. He spends much of his time thinking about the same things that you were all just talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, or about five minutes before that, around urban parking issues, urban mobility issues, um, that extends to, to uh, various forms of, of transit. Uh, but actually one of Paul's real strengths is urban parking. And that is very important because a downtown that is going to thrive is going to have more people living <laughs> and shopping in it and probably working. That's a bigger question right now uh, because of COVID. Uh, and therefore, really understanding how to manage parking supply so that we don't have to spend a lot on parking uh, is very important, how to share parking. 
Um, Mark Norman is not with Stantec. Uh, he has his own firm, Ideas in Action. He's somebody we work with a lot. I met him actually in a, for a project in Charlottesville, Virginia, a number of years ago. He is as good as it gets from my perspective in understanding uh, how to assess affordable housing needs and how to finance them. Uh, and that is a growing issue in every community. And I'm going to add another dimension to that in a minute for Reading and other cities. Uh, Larissa Ortiz is also from another firm. Uh, we work with her whenever we can around downtown retail and small business issues. Uh, and she is particularly excited about uh, Reading. This is not because this is just what she specializes in uh, and not just because she is Puerto Rican uh, by descent, but she is really interested in diverse downtowns and how to really pull the magic from their small business and, and retail communities. Uh, Sarah Woodworth is somebody I've worked with for decades. Uh, she has her own firm. She is the best person I know at understanding how to put together effective public-private partnerships that close gaps after taking advantage of every funding source available, uh, particularly for market-driven market rate development to, that is does not qualify for affordability um, uh, subsidies uh, and making sure that these public-private partnerships are investments, not grants, meaning that they really pay off. And I think she will play an important role here. There are a whole bunch of other people here. If you have questions, I can tell you who they are, uh, but why don't I go on just to honor your time. Um, so I'm gonna sort of set the stage by talking and talk about fundamental trends that offer more opportunity to Reading downtown going forward. You couldn't have picked a better time, believe it or not, to do this study, even, even in the midst of COVID. Um, and what some of the opportunities are they unlock. So let's start with, uh, let me take a step back. I'm gonna start with COVID for a minute. COVID has taught us some really important lessons that are new, how much people love walking around. It's actually, in many ways, COVID has been a something that, while there's been a lot of talk about people flying, fleeing to suburbs, it's actually pointed out the advantages that urban places and town, towns have. People really like walking. They really like walking to places like a riverfront where they can enjoy nature, but they don't have to drive and get in a car to get there. <clears throat> they love places that have outdoor dining, partly because it's fun to eat outdoors, partly because you walk by and you see your neighbors and it's a way to feel this, a sense of community that really comes with a downtown or an urban neighborhood. Uh, it certainly cast major questions around demand for office space, not jobs, office space, uh, because uh, we're not losing jobs. We're losing, them. we may be losing folks who wanna work in a traditional office, but they're still working. And in many cases, it turns out, particularly if they don't have kids, they want to live downtown when they're not working in an office because they want to live in a place full of community because they're not getting at the office. So that's actually some way sort of a pro downtown development. Retail has been under stress for quite a while as we shop online and, and uh, um, mass market retail generally has been in decline. But what has been rising is retail you can walk to, particularly if folks can walk there in about five minutes and downtown's excel as they grow population at building that kind of retail. So what are the big trends? And, and then there are a series of fundamental trends that COVID has not changed that are very supportive of downtowns uh, for the next certainly 20 years, sort of as, as entry and next era. One is that our demographics are rapidly changing. So for many years, sing, uh, families with kids and two parents and kids dominated housing markets Going forward between, uh, well, 2019 is pretty much the same as 2021 and the early mid 2030s, uh, most of the growth is going to be singles and couples without kids and single parents with kids who both really prefer urban living, uh, living where they can walk around, see friends, go to cool restaurants. And I don't mean just uh, West Reading over and over again. I mean, all kinds of cool restaurants because they're unique and distinctive and, and really go to stroll to a riverfront and see friends. This is what the, they don't go someplace because of a big backyard. So what that means is that Reading and virtually every other region has a real imbalance in housing supply. There's gonna be a lot more 
demand that is not met with supply yet for urban downtown housing. And we have to figure out how to unlock it. Uh, COVID has clearly affected different parts of our economy in different ways. I think you all have been living this as you keep your, your downtown and your city going during this very stressful period. Um, uh, from a downtown standpoint, probably the challenges retail has felt have been the most significant. And the fact that we're gonna get, get used to a new jobs environment, again, doesn't mean fewer jobs, doesn't even mean fewer jobs in downtown, it means fewer jobs in um, fewer uh, in, in traditional office space. So a shift in demand from office space to housing. Um, what has also been going on for some time, as you all know, is that our uh, economy is really shifting to a knowledge economy, uh, shifted, I guess we should say, but 90 plus percent of net new jobs, that's, that's all our economic growth for the next 20 years, are gonna require a fair amount of education, at least some college education. Today, for the first time in our history, even a majority of manufacturing jobs require some college. So what places are set up for this economy? And this time I'll be ahead of you, Paul, next. It is places that have the walkability, the, the retail, the riverfront, the places that create community, that bring people together. Um, the folks who are better, who with more education are even more interested in living in downtowns than their peers. And I know this sounds very elitist, but actually the best way to create jobs for everybody is to increase knowledge jobs because each new knowledge worker creates somewhere between three, five, maybe even six other jobs. These are often jobs for folks who were losing the, their, their jobs and who really need the new jobs that knowledge industry spins off. Uh, and uh, as we go forward, we're gonna be, this is gonna touch on your parking conversation, entering a new decade, of, a new era of mobility. I'm sure everyone on this call has heard about autonomous mobility and probably everybody thought, well, that's off in the future. And it is, but not that far. So we're already in an era where more and more people are sharing mobility using um, Uber and Lyft, et cetera, which is, I'm sorry, just go back just for a second. Um, and, um, but going in, it, the US auto fleet turns over every 15 years. 15 years from now, virtually all the cars we drive are gonna have enough connected technology to talk to each other. That means our street lanes can get narrower and as we develop more of downtown, we won't have to create lots of new parking uh, because when cars park themselves, they park them a lot more efficiently than we do, meaning in less space. So a, a garage built to hold 500 cars will be able to hold 700 cars or more uh, in 15 years. Uh, that may sound far off now, but we can plan toward this and really minimize the just tremendous, you have a lot of parking. That's a resource for development if you don't have to pay for still more parking. And going forward, we'll need to less and less. Then in the 2040s, we'll be in the era of autonomous mobility. That people used to think meant everyone was gonna jump in their Tesla and drive forever playing computer games to their house in the country. It turns out it'll probably work just the opposite because for the next 20 years and beyond, most new, net new households won't have kids. They don't want to live out in the country. What they will like is the fact that they don't have to spend $12,000, $2,020 to own each new car. They can save all that money or about half of it, just press a button and this little vehicle, this Miz will show up and take them where they wanna go because they live in a downtown with a critical mass of people and destinations that for most of their trips will mean they don't have to go find a car and then figure out how to park it and save a lot of money in the, in the process. So near-term and longer-term trends are very pro-downtown. Um, I think I've mentioned, and I'll really turn the floor over to Paul here in a second, but uh, that there's just much more interested in urban public space and having a great riverfront uh, is, and, and the other parks that you have and are, and are seeking to invest in makes a real difference. And next well, the, well, the, the pandemic is the place where we all realize that being outside is yeah. the place to be safe. Uh, and it placed a tremendous amount of emphasis on, on, on public space, on open space, on green space, 
uh, and, and the funding environment is, is also uh, responding uh, to, to that reality and, and that level of importance. Um, breaking down uh, the study area of the, <clears throat> of the, Reading, uh, of the Reading Downtown Plus, uh, it's kind of three, uh, three areas, right? There's sort of the central core uh, that is Fifth and Penn. Uh, there is the area that is the waterfront, and then there's the area that we're kind of calling uh, Franklin Station. And we're kind of thinking about those three core focus areas as a way to organize um, improvements and recommendations as we as we move forward. Um, in terms of uh, the work that we're doing, a lot of it is essentially about about placemaking, where we're focusing on streets and circulation, parks and open space, buildings and land use. Um, but those things, you know, cycle down into the scope of work that we are providing. Right, um, as David talked about, um, the innovative public engagement strategy, and and we're using an online tool called Mural. We're going to launch a website soon. Um, so lots of ways in which people can participate in the plan and understand vision and identity. Um, <clears throat> on the planning and urban design side, we're, we're looking at existing conditions, we're evaluating uh, zoning, we're taking a look at mobility, uh, we'll be looking at conceptual planning, green spaces, opportunities for mixed use development, um, determining highest and best use, infrastructure improvements, uh, some alignment with the parking authority, they were one of our stakeholder uh, meetings and, and things about arts, culture, and public art. But the big piece that we've heard over and over again is this column on the, on, on the, on the far right, which is about the financial analysis and implementation. And every, all the meetings that we're having um, are meant to be focused on an imp, uh, implementable ideas in the short, mid, and long term, uh, which is why, as David explained, uh, we brought the team to the table that we brought to the table because we wanted the best of the best. Uh, to, be, to be here with us and with you guys to look at the market, to understand the issues about um, retail action, to understand business retention issues about um, financing and incentives, uh, uh, identifying gaps, implementation strategies. And so this is kind of the basis of the work uh, that, that we're gonna do. Um, in reference to the schedule, as Jamal said, we're kind of in a six, now seven, uh, seven month process. Um, we're here on the front end. Um, we're still learning. Um, we've done a ton of uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, many of you on the call we've met with and we cannot thank you enough for the information that you've given to us. And with each meeting we have, um, I end up sending uh, Jamal and Naomi another email that says, oh, by the way, we need to talk to these people as well. Um, because with each meeting, there's just another layer of enthusiasm and cooperation and collaboration that gets us far more excited about the next meeting to have. Um, so, but where we are now, just to give you guys the general update in the process is we're still in stakeholder interviews. I think we have maybe two or three more that we'll do um, in the next week. Um, our folks at Street Sense, um, we're going to preview the residential market uh, analysis data tomorrow internally as a team, uh, meet with Mark Norman, our housing guy, uh, to sort of understand what that, in, what that data is about. Uh, and then they're going to move on to the commercial side of it. Um, we had a great session uh, last week with, uh, with Sarah Woodworth, uh, just learning more about the city's current tools for implementation understanding issues about taxes and uh, abatements and other issues uh, to, and to sort of understand what the current um, products are. Um, we're doing a deeper dive on arts and culture. We've got a company called Materials Conservation and they're on board as a subconsultant um, and they're gonna do a deeper dive uh, on arts and culture. And based on a session that we had last week with Albright, Alvernia um, and the community college, um, we want to do a deeper dive on entrepreneurism incubation because um, there's a lot of stuff going on on the ground in terms of a collaboration of people that are really looking um, to grow home-based uh, businesses that, that can get patents and get venture capital and build companies and build jobs and build reading. And what we've learned has been nothing aside from completely um, phenomenal. Um, we're using an online whiteboard product. And if I can maybe share a different screen, I think I can get there over here. Let's see if that works. 
Are we there? Yeah. So this is an online whiteboard called Mural. Uh, and we've used it uh, throughout the process to do our uh, steering committee meetings. Uh, this is an in initial tour that we had with the group where we just put dots and, and notes uh, you know, on the project. We talked about historic districts. We talked about uh, you know, important issues. Uh, you know, a little bit about schedule. We talked about, you know, uh, uh, the, the creation of a steering committee. Uh, we shared historical pictures to talk about, you know, what was Reading? What, you know, what, what, what could Reading be? Uh, this little map goes to a link with a bunch of uh, photographs uh, that I took when I had a tour there uh, with Naomi. And we started to think about, you know, what are, you know, particular opportunities along Penn, along Biff, along the waterfront. Uh, around <clears throat> around the station, and then uh, we've also you know had a series of of stakeholder groups, and I'm going to go back to another share. Bear with me; I have three screens in front of me, so I'm, I'm playing I'm, I'm playing magician here for a second. Um, and this has been a place for us to, uh, in a singular place, um, take notes, make notes, uh, visually listen uh, to folks as we're learning more. Uh, and it's really been a fantastic uh, way for us to really understand uh, ideas and aspirations and, and a place for them to live. Um, <clears throat> we're about ready to launch a, a website uh, for the project. Uh, there's a couple more uh, things that we need to get completed in order to do that. Um, and I'm gonna share this screen, um, but this is generally the website where it sits right now. Uh, critical to its success uh, is the fact that from the very onset of the website, uh, you get to come on and, uh, and pick your language of choice. Uh, that language, uh, the language choice translates through this community survey, through this interactive map. Uh, there's a survey here where we ask all kinds of questions about things that you're looking for in downtown. When are you there? How do you get around? What are the kinds of things that are important? Uh, the website has an interactive map uh, where you can, you know, pick a strength or a challenge or an opportunity and place it, place it on the map and, and talk about, you know, what that challenge or opportunity is. Can everybody see the website? Am I sharing my screen properly? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, not yet, uh, Desmond, who's doing the parking study, we don't have their landing page yet, uh, but we do have a holding place here uh, so that if people's issue is about parking, uh, that they can go to their website. Desmond's website will have a link to this website uh, so that everybody can get a chance to participate in as many ways as possible. Uh, this part of the website sort of talks about the project and asks for people's uh, input. Um, we've got a bit of a section here uh, that just shows some, some imagery. And if anybody here on this call has images to share, we'd love uh, to put them up on, on the website. Uh, back again down to this community survey, the interactive map and an ideas wall where you can, where you can put your input in. Uh, there's a bit of a roadmap in terms of where we are right now. We're still in existing conditions. Once the website uh, has got all of its edits done, we'll move into the online open house for about a month. Uh, we'll let people get a chance to put input. We'll share that link with you. We'll share that link with all of the stakeholders that we've met with so that people can uh, you know, send the information out so that we can get as much information as possible. Uh, we'll come back and do a community workshop once we've gotten through the ideas portion of the project. Um, and we'll come back again and have a final presentation. But you guys will see this information prior to the community workshop mm -hmm. and prior uh, to the final presentation. Uh, there'll be an area where we can put sample documents up, um, and then there's places where uh, folks can connect with social media and also uh, email and ask questions. Go back to the screen. All right. Uh, <laughs> you guys open for some questions at this point. Does any members of council have any questions at this time? Yeah, this is a great time for questions. And then I can, I can, I can finish through the rest. Oh, no, I, I thought you were done. Just continue on and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll jump there in. Is, there are a few more slides to go through, yeah. Couple more. Um, oh, wow. So, <laughs> we, just a few, just a few, I promise. 
Um, so we've been taking a look at opportunity sites, uh, looking through building condition, looking through vacancy, looking through uh, recent investment. Um, you know, the sites that are in this dark green, we think are ripe and, you know, might be likely to change. Uh, the yellows are the unknowns, right? Maybe there's upper floor vacancy, maybe there's not. Um, and the red and the reds are firm, you know, things where there's, you know, like the like the community college, like that's not going anywhere. Um, and and then in the outline purple are the uh, Keystone Opportunity Zone sites. So and we're using this data on top of some inventory uh, that we're getting from Naomi to then match the market data with where opportunity sites are, uh, so that we can think about where some of these catalytic investments could happen. And then this the very green. Uh, piece is, is, is the parks. I mean, granted, uh, it's a very large city park, but also the waterfront, uh, the recreation site, and then uh, Heritage Park and the, and the soon-to-be uh, skate park. Um, we started to take a little bit of a look at public realm, uh, thinking through, uh, you know, reimagining the public open space at Penn and Fifth, uh, thinking about ways to increase connectivity to the waterfront, the existing industrial uh, businesses and the community college are, are, may, are perhaps not likely to change in the near term future. So what are the ways in which we can increase connectivity? Uh, thinking about ways to improve intersections and pedestrian, pedestrian connectivity and safety, uh, streetscape enhancement, uh, opportunities to introduce east and west and north south um, bike connections, um, and thinking about opportunities for um, increasing uh, active and passive recre recreation um, and programming, and that came out of some meetings with the Parks and Rec and also uh, the folks at the trail. Um, we talked before about the, the number of stakeholder engagement meetings that we've had, and they've all been fantastic. We've just got a few more to go, um, but we have learned uh, a tremendous amount uh, from all of these sessions. But it, you know, really boils down to uh, you know some some really interesting bullet points. Um, unanimously. Uh, the new leadership at City Hall is making a difference. Um, everyone is telling us there is more connection, there is more collaboration, there is more communication, there's more participation, um, and, 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 and there is a feeling of definite change. Um, when we had our session with the folks in, art, in the arts and culture community, this is a unique asset, both um, at the individual artist, at the grassroots artist, at the maker space uh, artist, all the way to performances, and uh, there, there is a unique a uh, huge opportunity here to, to capitalize on the asset of arts and culture, uh, to, to, to think about Reading as, as, as a unique, visitable, uh, and fantastic place. Um, capitalizing on the Latinx community as a unique identity. Um, the, the, the thing that, that our, our implementation folks have talked about us with is that the study area is really large, right? We could try and do a little bit of something everywhere in the study area. And it might be like spreading a, a, a teaspoon of salt over such a large area that, that it might not be noticeable. Um, so we have to think about prioritization. And I think that's about you know, building on the momentum that's currently happening in the center core with the number of projects that are happening, Alvernia, uh, the, the Madison building and others. I mean, things are happening. Uh, so capitalizing on the investment that's already happening to make further investment in the core sounds like, sounds like uh, an important thing to do. Um, the activation of upper floors, particularly at 5th and 10, um, and other places along the corridor is, 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 is a huge issue, and, and we need to be thinking through that. Um, the, the fact that the institutional and educational community is engaged and collaborating in this issue around incubation and job creation is like, like that's going to make something real and fantastic happen. Uh, we're taking a look at zoning of the CC zoning and others to see other ways that mixed use and active uses can be more supported. Um, in, in my review of the zoning code, if you type in outdoor dining as a term, it doesn't exist in the zoning code. You know, so where are the ways that zoning can simplify to allow for greater diversity and activation of use? Mm -hmm. um, continuing to increase uh, mixed income housing, uh, in a number of the meetings that we've had, more incentives, uh, and everyone that we've talked to is, is open. You know, we have the incentives that we have. What are the other incentives that we can bring to the table? Um, and upgrading the riverfront, um, but maybe more about the park first, uh, programming, maintenance, light, 
uh, eyes on it, safety, uh, you know, might be a, a first step about about that activation versus thinking about what 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 development changes might happen adjacent to it. Um, more events, more things to do, more places to go. We we talked with folks that said, "I moved out of Reading because there's nothing to do here." Um, the, and I'm going to bring up parking. I mean, because there is a perceived lack of parking downtown. I'm going to say downtown. Um, obviously, in the conversation that we had earlier, or that we listened to earlier, and I live in a neighborhood too, where if I, if I if I get up in the morning and I go to walk my dog, I can't get across the crosswalk because there's a car in the way. Right. I, I live in an overparked neighborhood, but I think in the downtown core. Um, with a number of parking structures and a next parking structure that's about to, to happen with the event space. Um, in downtown, uh, there's maybe not a lack of parking, but it might be better signed. If I were coming down Penn Street for the first time, I'm not sure that there's enough wayfinding signage to get me to the parking that, that, that I could then stop and visit downtown. Um, folks have told us that the regulatory environment could be a little more business friendly. Um, that the that the safety is a perception, lack of safety is a perception, uh, not a reality. Um, and when we think about uh, folks that are moving from big cities to other urban areas, I read an article recently, David, that said 85% of people that moved in the pandemic still moved to another urban place. They didn't leave cities, they just moved to other cities. But a lot of people made choices to live in cities that were slightly smaller than the cities they came from, where rail was possible, so they could have a more affordable uh, uh, way of life, but still be able to connect to, to their larger uh, their larger center city. And and I'll I'm, I talk as fast as I can, and I'll leave her questions. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Thank you for for your work so far. Um, two questions for you. To what you can answer at this point. First one is what, what makes Reading the, the best city to move forward and take advantage of the situation that is happening post COVID uh, based on its various characteristics? And number two, what makes Reading the most challenging city to deal with post COVID based on its characteristics, location, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two questions that come from um, opposite points of view. David, you're muted. David, you're muted. Bang, very quietly. Do you want me to start or do you want to? No, go ahead. Well, okay. Um, so what, what makes it, uh, what, what makes, what are the unique, unique is not quite the right word. Word opportunities are very present and in combination really make this a wonderful place. Uh, and uh, they have a whole lot to do with, uh, both with Reading, but with what people want at this point. So having a lot of history, historic architecture uh, is really matters uh, uh, along walkable streets. That is something that, that people uh, are, are really, more and more people want, want to live and also work in places like that, places that have authenticity. Um, the fact that you have a large Hispanic community downtown uh, is a has is is a um, a wonderful piece of that authenticity because there aren't lots of downtowns where you can go and see really celebrate a kind of a a, a rich culture like that. Whether you can do it as much as would be good for downtown, no that doesn't happen enough in downtown Reading yet. I, I, I'm, I shouldn't stop with the opportunities too soon because I'm not done, but, but we're gonna come back to that because that's sort of an unrealized opportunity. Uh, the fact that you've got universities and, and the community college who are really interested in um, uh, helping business startups, in entrepreneurship, in unlocking the potential of people who are in, who are in downtown or could be of downtown is a tremendous asset. Um, uh, there are a lot of communities that don't have that. There are people with great ideas, there are empty storefronts and there's no way to connect the two. You've got a way to make that connection, which is somewhat about money, but also about training and giving people the sort of skills and understanding. The, the riverfront, the fact that the riverfront is not only beautiful, but as I understand it, I'm still a little skeptical, 
that people can actually touch the river and it's okay. Meaning that I don't know if any of you have been to Chattanooga, but Chattanooga is a city, it was an old industrial city uh, and had a mayor who was a planner and he decided we got to change. So one of the first things he did was invest not that much money because you can, how should I say, public realm landscape stuff doesn't cost as much as buildings and created one of the coolest waterfronts in North America because you can go down to the waterfront, walk into the water, touch it, play in it, not get caught in a tide, et cetera. You have that kind of opportunity. Um, when you put all these together, it's a pretty special place. Now it would be a sp just as special in 1970, 80 or 90 if it had all this, but given our demographics and where our economy is, those are very positive ingredients. If that makes sense and tell me if it doesn't, but greatest challenge I think is to be very direct, it's unlocking the potential of having a large concentrated Hispanic community downtown. And I hope I'm not speaking inappropriately. I mean, everybody is welcome, but you already have West Reading. You don't need two West Reddings. Um, mm -hmm. This exactly. is a chance to come to have a different kind of a downtown that mm -hmm. has, you know, there are West Reddings all over America. People love all of them. Uh, you have a chance to do something pretty special with downtown and it's about mobilizing not mobilizing, unlocking the energy of this community. It'll take some financing. It'll take the kinds of entrepreneurial institutes and, and capabilities that your downtown institutions have. And I've probably forgotten about 12 important things. Oh, and getting developers who really know how to use historic tax credits. Because that's, you know, it's nice to use somebody else's money. Uh, and, you know, that takes training and it takes some help. Um, I'm gonna say something very controversial now that Paul wishes I wouldn't, but we do a lot of work with the International Downtown Association. And I understand there were grave problems with the downtown partnership that you had, and it was time for it to go on to a better place. Uh, but I'd love to be able to, we'd love to work with you and the International Downtown Association and downtown directors from similar cities to help you put the right organization together because they can really make a lot of magic happen. Is that getting your questions? It's, it's, it's yeah, you're getting, you're getting, you're, you're getting sort of to where I, what I okay. was thinking you might respond to. There were a few other things, but I'll let those go for now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Other question? Looks like Marsha has her hand up. Yes, and actually the, my background is uh, the view of the cherry trees that were along the uh, Schuylkill River in, in the spring. So, and by the way, just saw an eagle flying down the river oh, uh, cool. near one of the, uh, the heritage parks. So it's incredible. But one of the things I've noticed, and I've worked downtown since 1975, and I see all the different changes from there being a lot of uh, concentrated high-end kind of retail, to a lot of changes happening. But the most notable change I'm seeing happening more recently is a lot of what used to be office spaces is being converted into housing. And does that go along with what your study is gonna be looking at? How, if you have a lot more people living right in the downtown core, then that opens up opportunities for different types of business. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be piggy and jump in again. Um, so yes. But I have to say, if we had done this study before COVID, we would have been very focused on getting as many people to live downtown because people living downtown support business on the street, retail, food, breweries, et cetera, uh, to a much greater extent than people working downtown. They spend a good deal more than twice as much per, per capita per person. Uh, so but getting people living downtown to bring life to the streets because that's what then attracts talent and jobs and investment and therefore office space. Now, because how we view office space has changed, and I think fundamentally, not meaning that no one will come back to office space, but it'll be some time before we need more office space uh, as we work through our hybrid models. Um, the ability to attract folks to live downtown who then uh, uh, support life on the street downtown attracts another kind of jobs. And those are the folks who are working from home or, or well, working from home and in their office some of the time. And I think that is a really important market to, to tap. 
Um, we may need to figure out how to raise some tax dollars from people who are working downtown. We don't know how to, working at home, we don't know how to do that now. We, we tax the office they work in, uh, not the work. Um, so we may have to solve that problem. Um, but uh, we're gonna be looking very hard at um, all the uses that can come downtown. Uh, and once again, at how we can tie these to things like historic tax credits that can really bring investment. Am I getting at your question? Yeah, and again, I've just seen the transformation both from working downtown, uh, my offices have always been downtown, but now I'm working hybrid remotely. And in the office, the office has been made a lot smaller because more people are working remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, my one concern that I have is because a lot of banking institutions were downtown, that's no longer going to be the case. We have several vacant buildings that had housed banking industries. Is that going to be part of the planning, how to be refitting those? Because it's yeah. an extraordinary amount of office space that's now going to be vacant. Yes, and I, I, I know this sounds like a silver bullet, and I know there's no such thing, but I'll do it anyway. The more downtown is attractive to people to as a place to live, and therefore the more money they are spending, the more assured we can be that space will get filled and that other and that actually new kinds of businesses will want to come downtown. So the, the starting point for all of this is to make sure we have the market engine because there's never enough public money or institutional money to fill spaces. Is this making sense? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I would be pretty confident that space, there will not be a lot of vacant space in 10 years in downtown Reading. If that's, and I'm sorry to say 10 years, but I'll just cast it that way for now. I'm going to be hanging in here for the city and see what happens. I don't know if we'll be working downtown in another 10 years, but I certainly will be uh, being part of the transition. So thank well, you. As, as long as you convert your offices to housing and live there. No, no, that's right. Sorry. Okay, thank you. All right, additional Johanny. Yes, and thank you for the presentation. I, I you know, the first image on your presentation um, of your presentation, I was like, ooh, I'd love to see our downtown look that way with the lights <laughs> and so much activity. Um, question regarding the community survey. How is that being disseminated? So I'm going to answer very quickly and say something and then turn it over to Paul. That is actually Brockton, Massachusetts, which I'm going to say has a very large, here we would say a Latinx population, and it's tapping into that, that community, bring, making them one of the engines of downtown that's unlocking the ability to have that food street that you saw. But on that note, Paul. So once we get a few more edits uh, done on the website, uh, which will work with Jamal and Naomi uh, to clean up. Um, we'll distribute that website to you guys. We'll distribute it to every group uh, that we've met with uh, from on the stakeholder standpoint, um, and then ask those people to share those things out. So it's going to be a it's going to be a grass it's going to be a grassroots share. And if I and if I'm not speaking correctly, Jamal, let me know. <laughs> You know, Paul, I think this is the right way and uh, what we are going to do once we have the uh, website, the question website already, we will uh, link it to uh, the city website as well. And we will make reference to it in all the meetings that we attend, uh, like the PP meetings that we have, the GRCA meetings, all of, all of those will be actually, and we will we will have the website directly linked in in many ways, so that we we'll make it very easy for a for, for a person to uh, to to tap uh, to I mean link in, fill up the uh, questionnaires, and provide us with all that information. And as Paul mentioned, that in the Google search there you will can, you actually don't need to be fluent in English. You can use it in your native language. So if you would like to use uh, Spanish, that will be fine if some other people, and I know we have some who they speak uh, Russian or Ukrainian, that, that will also be applicable to them as well. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Hi, gentlemen. Additional questions, Lucine? Go ahead. 
Yeah, so I look forward um, to speaking with you and I really appreciate this preliminary presentation. I think that as, you know, society, um, we're experiencing some, some openings and some loosenings on, on mandates and restrictions. And a lot of the questions I hear is what's going to be happening downtown. So I think it's really relevant that you're here with us this evening um, to kind of bring that first update to uh, the public at large. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that uh, I think one, one question that really stood out to me from what I had seen on the uh, outreach for through the website is, you know, who can participate? I think that was like one of the last drop down, but, um, you know, who can participate? And so I think the grassroots approach is appropriate. And I want to make sure that we all together do our best to get it out to all the stakeholders. So not necessarily the stakeholders who are part of the advisory committees, but if we're talking truly about a community and culturally centric downtown um, for our largest, most representative demographic, that we're hitting um, and reaching them for their input, uh, whether it's by culture or by age or by gender, um, you know, we, we need to be as inclusive as possible. So I look forward to speaking to you more directly about this and also making sure that our community participates a really high level of participation, which is what you need so that Clearly, when we come out of this study, we have something that represents a unified vision for what the future um, and a COVID recovered <laughs> or recovery path looks like for our city, um, which is going to be a beautiful thing. So thank you. Yep. Paul and Dave, I'd like to ask a question that was asked of us before. Uh, with, considering that we will have a lot of uh, residential units downtown, would you see that there will be a negative impact on the school district for that? No, in a word. Um, so most of the, um, as I mentioned, most of the net new demand is going to frankly be from singles and couples without kids. I think to be very direct, the biggest challenge that school districts are going to have is maintaining um, enrollment. Now, what they're going to have is a larger tax base of households without kids to pay for education, which is can be terrific. But most communities we work with are more worried about keeping enough kids in their schools over the next 10 years and 20 years. And I hope that sounds plausible to, to folks. It's uh, um, <clears throat> When you mentioned having a multicultural community, one of the great things about that is that communities that don't attract a lot of immigration and are not viewed as multicultural are really having problems with aging these days and not enough kids. So that's a gratuitous comment, but I had to throw it out. Thank you. Additional comments, anyone? All right, if not, we thank you guys. Um, we look forward uh, Continue dialogue. I know I have a. I'm trying to schedule here in the next week or so, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll we'll have an opportunity to meet one on one. And for those who didn't, please make sure you schedule through Jamal. And yes. a lot of moving parts downtown. A lot of opportunities. So and and we, to be honest, have to thank Jamal and your really terrific city staff who have been very helpful and very <laughs> substantive in the way they've been helping us. And we really appreciate and county staff also. In, in terms of the information they have, the perspective they bring. So thank you. And it just, I mean, to close, uh, you know, when I had been to Reading for a long time and I had forgotten uh, when I came up for a visit and I got back after the visit and I called David and I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, this town is like so amazing. There's like, there's so much like intact, like cool architecture, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then we had a meeting about, uh, you, know, you know, downtown. And then we had a meeting about, parking and then we had a meeting about incubators and then we had a meeting about arts and culture and then we had a meeting about you know incentives and other stuff and with every single meeting that we have I get a little more excited than the last time that we had a meeting and uh you know to the first point about the issue about communication collaboration uh and participation um th this is this is really exciting stuff this is really exciting stuff. And we're really, really, really happy to be here. And we're happy that you uh, chose us uh, to, to, to play our part. 
uh, in your steps forward. And it's just, it's really a pleasure to have had a chance to connect with you all tonight. Um, Council President, Jamar yeah, here. Jamar. Yeah, I didn't have a question somewhere. It's just a, a statement or a response to something that Marsha had posed. Um, and I would respectfully submit part of what attracted me to wanting to come to work at the city was the idea that I would be able to live on Penn Street and walk to work. Uh -huh. um, the reality was a little different that, you know, the housing stock isn't quite set up for that yet, but certainly <coughs> young urban professionals like myself want to come to smaller situated cities like Reading to live and thrive and flourish and just walk or play or whatever the, the um, slogans are, but it's actually true. Um, so, and I'm one of those people. Um, so the market is certainly there um, and, and the attraction is there. We just got to build a downtown. And that's just, you know, me as an individual, okay. thank you. You're, you're who's going to build it, so thank you. All right, if there are no other comments, we, uh, we thank you again um, for the uh, presentation and we look forward to uh, an ongoing dialogue and uh, not only is the city of Reading, but the region is excited about, you know, us being able to execute a, a plan that, that's got some real legs and some real meat to it. So we're looking forward to that. Um, with that in mind, council, uh, we, we, we don't have an executive session tonight that has been postponed uh, per Fred's request. Um, is there any other items for public discussion that anyone needs to talk about? I see Johanny's hand. Uh, we'll start off with Johanny. So just a re, oh, well, first, congratulations to the CD department because I saw PMI on the streets today uh, inviting, extending an invitation to downtown business owners for tomorrow's mm -hmm. meeting that's scheduled at 9 a.m. at in front of the Doubletree. So for those watching on Facebook, tuning in, reminder, 9 a.m., downtown, uh, or the designated uh, prior downtown improvement district business owners are invited to attend this session. And also, uh, Council President Jeff, I do have a question regarding um, when we're going to get back to um, our, our, our committee meetings as it relates to finance, for example. I know we haven't had like a budget discussion in a while, went on six months, and soon I know we'll be going into budget season. So just if we can, I, you know, I remember a time when we had like the select um, committee of the holes. Or, or, or time designated for finance and other items. So just- Yeah, um, we're gonna actually be picking the speed up there pretty soon as we get into some of this uh, uh, money, the stimulus money that's gonna be coming forward. Um, we're gonna be spending time um, deeply in finance. And then as the, as the year evolves towards the middle or end of the summer, we'll have carved out a lot more time on the agenda. And I'll, I'll kind of defer to Marsha a little bit on what she feels the budget process will look like this year, because she's still kind of our finance designee. Marsha, did you have any comments? Uh, yeah, as far as the finance, yeah, I think you're spot on, uh, Johanny. And I think we need to come up with a structure and a timeline considering that together with this budget is there's additional money coming into the city that we're going to need to have see how all the parts fit together and an extraordinary amount of needs that are out there that we're going to be able to fit everything together so i would like to be able to work now the one question i have for the body to consider is that i have been serving to facilitate this process for the last several years and we may we even want to relook at the process. We no longer have a finance committee. I have enjoyed shepherding this process forward, but I think the council needs to look at what the capacity of all the other council members are and how we lead this process moving uh, forward. And I certainly am very eager to mentor those of us. And I also would uh, be able to look at as we're going to be bringing new members onto council, as that starts to become more apparent, how that might look that we also want to engage them in the process so that their first time of decision making isn't after you know new members come on board. This is uh, a complicated process, so I want to see how how that moves ahead. And one of the things too, Johanny, that you've requested, I know um, Abe and I have talked about it. Uh, we're going to shoot for some time in June to have a priorities kind of summit 
um, where they can kind of go over with us what they believe their priorities are and that we can offer input, feedback, and suggestions as well. Uh, I know Abe is still trying to formulate that, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that sometime soon. So, uh, any other comments? Oh, go ahead, Johnny. And one last item, as CDC guidelines are changing, as City Hall is expected to be opening its doors to the public, I guess to resume uh, some sense of normal uh, operations, um, what is our plan then in terms of, um, you know, uh, Strat's question of when do we go back to the City Hall? So I'm just curious if we've thought about what our future plans are, are, are going to be for that to happen. Well, you make a good point. I mean, things have changed rather rapidly. I guess we should get some uh, in, impact, uh, some input from our chief uh, safety officer. I guess it's Jeremy um, and see, uh, I'll ask Linda to prompt him to see when he feels based on the new guidelines uh, what the uh, predications would be for us to reconvene. I know other entities are starting to do that um, I'm not opposed to considering it. I personally still don't feel we're completely out of this thing yet, but it's, if everyone's vaccinated and they're safe, um, even with vaccinations, people do get the virus, but they don't get quite the symptoms. Um, but I think now's the time to find out. It's a good point. Um, hoping that uh, we can do it soon. I know Strat would like to drag it on and on as long as he could, but, uh, Sometimes we have to get back in, back inside. I'm only kidding, straight. And any other, so it's, I'm gonna ask Linda to make that request, Johanny, copy us on it, and let's see where it goes. Marcia? Yeah, and I just wanted to be able to share with council uh, that, uh, and I have spoken with the mayor's office on this, that we are most likely gonna pull together a work group to look at some of the ways that we can uh, have a, improve the public use of our parks and our playgrounds. Uh, we know there's ongoing complaints about certain areas, but it's really happening citywide. And so I don't think we need to be able to say that summer's uh, upon us. And so rather than being reactive, we can be proactive. And I know both uh, Melissa and she can speak for herself. Uh, both of us serve on the Rec Commission and have a real concern on uh, what we do to be able to improve the quality of life within the parks and playground areas of our city. All right, any other comments uh, for public discussion at this point? We'll have other opportunities as well. So um, if there's anything pressing, if not, go ahead, Donna. And just dovetailing with that with what Marsha was saying, and I'm sure she, she got it. I've gotten text all weekend. Um, regarding the situation of the code, I realize it happens throughout the um, throughout the um, the city. But um, um, where do we go? I mean, I I just try to encourage people that you know our police do the best they can, and we're cognizant of it. Um, but there are concerns. There are concerns that it's it's being um, you know beyond the noise and the, the crowds that and it's capitalism at work that 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 vendors, food vendors are going up there, which only encourages further partying. Um, I don't know if that's also happening in Riverfront and other areas, but, um, you know, following the market. I mean, beyond the, 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 the issues of, of noise and, and crowds and, and concerns that way, um, that, that amenities are being offered for, for folks who are gathering. So I'm not sure how we deal with that. I, I'm bringing it up because in good faith, People have been texting me, and I simply don't know what to say. Is it Pagoda still? I'm hearing about. Yes. Jeff, yes. Well, I, well, I want to make a clarification, though. So before you go, let me make a comment. Okay. So yeah. yeah, I mean, if the if the neighbors up there are still being ambushed by noise, and our police are still babysitting, then we have to look at the next level of steps. Mm -hmm. to take. I mean, we can't waste precious resources mm -hmm. in playing cat and mouse games on a mountain. We've got a whole right. city. And I, I suggest the administration, as well as members of council, look at what we can do if it has to be gated off. What are Absolutely. I'm at, I'm at my wit's end to know how to respond. But I'm just at my I'm wit's end. I'm tired of talking about it. I can't imagine how those neighbors feel. 
Right. And they're they're just so totally upset, Jeff. They're so totally upset. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got to go to the extent if people can't, you know, within their spirits, respect other people's space and quietness mm -hmm. at night, you know, there's a time and place for noise. 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning is not the time and place for noise in somebody's back. Yeah, this is starting in the afternoon now. Yeah. Well, even that's not appropriate. So, uh, Marcia, go ahead and then we, we've got Yeah, and I think uh, because this is so extensive, and by the way, I don't want to be labeling the pagoda because, indeed, some of the noise that people in certain areas, and, and I, I gave Melissa a copy of the text because she is the council person representing that area. Uh, we will be working together. First of all, there was a response from the police that the uh, constituent that wrote the text acknowledged that that happened. But to Jeff's point, we can't be chasing around people and using our resources. Uh, it, it's happening all along Skyline Drive. Okay, so it isn't only pagoda centric and I don't want the public to believe the vendors are an issue. The, uh, the administration is aware of some of the things that can be done. We have to be working not only that we have enforcement, but we have successful enforcement. And that has to do with the correct signage, which isn't consistent across all of our parks and our playgrounds. The administration is aware of that. And so there are steps that are being taken, uh, but I think by working internally and coming up with what strategies can be working the best. The fact is it's going on because we haven't really implemented uh, except, and I want to be able to give a shout out to our police department. They've been doing an exemplary job of being able to handle situations that you, they have to uh, police the whole city, but are up there and doing what they need to do. When I say up there, I'm talking about the mountain and working together with Central Berks. Okay, so there's a lot of good collaboration going on. The point is people are gathering in large crowds, being very noisy not looking at their noise of affecting other people. So they're being very disrespectful. It's not only happening at night, it's starting in the mid afternoon. It's going on to all uh, hours. So even looking at a dust to dawn policy in it itself isn't gonna solve the problem. So we have to be able to look at it from all aspects. And I know most likely tonight on WFMZ, some of the neighbors on the North 14th street uh, area are gonna have been interviewed and so this will be bringing it more to the public light. So we have a responsibility to make sure that we have a good plan of action that not only looks at what's happening on the mountain, what's looking at what happened last year in the river and not be reactive to it. Okay, we know it's gonna be continuing to happen. The same uh, thing so, with the dirt bikes. So I, I'll, yeah. I will ask Abe if we can maybe address this again next Monday night, if there's something they can look at. Uh, I know, and I know what Johanny is saying, you know, we want a place for people to go I wish there were more alternative spots and I wish these people weren't so loud. I don't know why they have to be loud, but um, you know, we're not trying to keep people off of public properties, but we've got to respect people's investments in their homes and their neighborhoods. They have a right to have some peace and serenity in the middle of the day. They shouldn't have to hear boom boxes or whatever's going on from a thousand feet away. It just, it's not the way a community is built and people are probably feeling right now there are no laws and we have to, we have to have protocol. We have to have- That's, that's exactly you know, what I hear. Have civility. So right. let's try to reproach this again uh, with the administration and cooperative effort to see what we can come up to. I personally, I, I, I can't imagine how these neighbors feel. I'm tired of talking about it. Right. I've lived in Reading all my life. We're, we're tired of talking about it. They're tired of living it. Yeah, I, I can only imagine what they're feeling. So, and never in my life have I gone up there and pulled my speakers out of my car and blasted my music. I have no need to do that. I don't understand it. I get it. It might be something that the younger generation does, but they got to respect the laws and we have to make them aware. And if they can't abide by them, we're going to have to change the whole setup. And that's, that's the bottom yeah. line. Go ahead. Uh, we have noise ordinances, right? Do we enforce right. those? What are the fines mm -hmm. for those? I mean, maybe yeah. just enforcement. I don't know if that, that's happening. I mean, I know that we're pretty stretched out, but, and also, I mean, there's also, you know, as we saw the presentation uh, with the downtown plus, but when we look at our city, there's areas that obviously we need to further develop, right? To create for, right. to allow for that, to, to create an environment for, for some activity to take place that are well monitored, right? That we don't violate some of the noise ordinances. Um, but it sounds like an enforcement. I, I don't, I don't know. 
I haven't been around to hear how loud it is. Is it music? Is it car? Jemani, you should go up sometime. It will give you, it would be an eye-opening experience. Okay. Absolutely eye-opening. I think you'll, you'll better understand what, what the residents are going through. And is it a weekend thing? Is it it's, more of a no. weekend or it's just every day? It's whenever the groups of people that bring their vehicles together decide that they're going to congregate. It's whenever the weather is nice. Yeah, good, good, good That's point, Melissa. Yeah. Whenever the weather is nice, everyone's mm -hmm. up there blasting their music, smoking hookah, and it's, it, it is embarrassing. And when someone wants to go up there just to chill and watch the, the watch writing and just sit back and maybe have a conversation, you can't do that because it's loud and exactly you can't tell them anything because then someone gets disrespectful and then everything becomes a scene and what's what do we, are we have do we have officers there or are like at any point or security mm -hmm. or anything i think the administration needs to speak to that yes They're yes uh, let me just say this uh, first of all we recognize that this is a terrible problem and uh, definitely a quality of life issue. Uh, Linda, myself, and Sergeant Fagley, we had a preliminary meeting to discuss whether or not the ordinances in place are effective. We determined that they are, and it is a question of enforcement and it's a question of priority. And the officers themselves are fatigued which, with having to respond to the complaints at all hours, at all times. And I think that one of the things that we really need to do is come up with signage that also has the citation in terms of a violation and a fine. And these fines, in my opinion, need to be uh, punitive in some instances because we have repeat offenders and it's a quality of life issue. And those residents deserve better. And I'm sure that we could provide something better for them, but it's a question of the signage. It's a question of the citation. And I've also uh, been making phone calls to uh, magisterial district justices to ensure that once these individuals who are culpable come before them, that they don't get a slap on the wrist. We wanna make sure that our laws are being enforced correctly so nobody walks out of their scot free uh, with a sob story of any kind, but the, the quality of life issues are real and uh, the fatigue is, is everywhere, not just with the residents, uh, but with the members of the police department as well, um, because they don't wanna be called at, uh, at all hours either, knowing that they have other pressing matters uh, for public safety in the city. So um, we will address this. Uh, it's gonna be, a, it's not gonna be something that's done overnight in terms of results. And perhaps uh, another idea is, is to really look at limiting the access to the pagoda in the evening, if at all possible. If that's something that council wishes to consider. And, and quite could honestly, we even put up things like jersey barriers to, to, to block off the parking that people could still drive around it, but they can't park there anymore? That's certainly something to consider, yeah, okay. Councillor, yes. Instead of trying to resolve this tonight, Abe, I think um, if council members have any ideas, they should forward it to Abe and Linda. Uh, I agree. And we have to get some kind of results soon because these people- but the sooner the better, not right, Jeff. Yeah. Whatever, right. whatever we can do um, in an immediate standpoint would be helpful. Even if we have, the way I see it, it sounds to me that the access is already shut down to the people who would like to go out there and have a peaceful view of the pagoda, from the pagoda. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily always getting that opportunity. I'm not saying it's always shut down, but there's times where people are probably being deterred. We've got to find a solution to at least give these people in that neighborhood some peace and then come back with a solution that can keep people away. I, I, most importantly, the residents of the city need to understand we, our police department doesn't have time to chase around mini bikes and tell people to keep their music down. Um, if they want Reading to be a successful place, we can have 15 stand techs and get nowhere if we don't show civility and people need to see civility. They need to know that if they invest here, it's going to be respected. And I know, Abe, I'm not giving you a speech. I know you you understand the quality of life needs. Um, but we we I'm just to the broader public. We we need to get this done. So, Abe, we'll send you our thoughts. If you can come back to us even by next Monday with just that's not a lot of time, but what you think we can do because we do have to be realistic, but we do have to give these people some relief. Sure. I need relief. I can't even talk about the pagoda anymore. I'm, I, it's a great great place to go. And it shouldn't be a place where people think it's a hangout. I, I know young people want to hang out. I wish there were more places for them. 
you know, if you go up in the middle of Lancaster County and pull out your speakers, they're going to have the same effect. If you went into a field, they're not going to want it there either. You know, there's just not many places where you can do that. All right, guys, any other comments? All right, if not, um, thank you everyone for attending this evening's meetings. Um, we will uh, regroup next Monday and uh, we will follow up um, with Abe regarding the Pagoda next week. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.